Okay. So, thanks, darling. So, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, or did not overcome it, in some translations. In verse 14, and the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Amen. So, in uh, verse 1, we have this incredible picture of the beginning. And obviously, the John here is talking about, he's relating to the beginning of creation, right? He's talking about what, what happened when the world was created. And so, you know, in the beginning of the Bible, you have the book of Genesis, and the first words are, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And so John here is trying to bring us something to complete that picture. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. So what's interesting about that phrase is it, it says he, it was with God, and to be with someone, you have to be separate from them, right? So you wouldn't say, I'm here with myself, you know what I mean, like that? Maybe some of us would, but that's a little weird. But, but you know, to be with someone, that means it's something different than you. And, but then the next sentence says, and the word was God. And so we have this incredible picture. You know, when, when someone speaks, those words represent who they are in a very um, tangible way. And so, um, especially when you're a child, you know, your, your words represent what you think. And then as we grow older, we kind of, um, you know, hide maybe more of who we are behind different kinds of Maybe we don't say everything we think anymore, you know, but when a little kid comes up to you and says, um, you know, you're fat, they, they really mean that, you know, <laughs> or whatever, you know, I mean, my kids say some crazy things sometimes, but, but uh, you know, they, they just say the truth about what they think, and, and God tells the truth all the time. Right? God isn't hiding anything. God isn't, you know, some sort of person who's trying to say something that's, that's incomprehensible. He's trying to communicate with humanity. And so his word, which went forward and created things. So how, how did the earth get created? God created by saying, let there be light. So his word said it, his voice said it, and the words came out, and there was light. And this is very interesting. And so... This idea that Jesus, because this is talking about the word becoming flesh. How? Into the, in Jesus. Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah. He, he is, you know, the living word of God in a certain sense. And so, so here we have this word that is exactly expressing the power and representing God in human form. Being born, as we celebrated just a little while ago, in the form of a small baby, and um, he came down to us. So, so God came to us. And let's, you know, let's think about this for a moment. We have the, it says, he was in the beginning with God. So, so this is talking about an eternal being, right? Somebody who lived forever. And we often, I think, act on earth as if we're going to live forever down here. You know, we don't think about the fact that we're going to, that this life is very short. 
And the longer I live, the more I realize how fast time is going by, and it just seems this is going to be over very soon. And then what? You know, there's been millions and millions of people who have lived before us, and they have come and they've gone. But Jesus is eternal. His life is forever, right? So here's an eternal being, and it says in verse 3 that all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So here we have this eternal, all-powerful being that created everything. Every single particle of every neutron, of every cell, of every, you know, of every living thing and non-living thing, all of these things were created by Jesus. That's a pretty powerful person. From our perspective, everything we see here, everything we feel, everything we breathe, all of this stuff came from him. But, you know, he's, so he's eternal and all-powerful. And in verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. There would be no life without Jesus. There would be no life, life or light for people. And this light shines in the darkness. And then in verse 14, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so this miraculous event happened. The, the creator, the all-powerful creator, the eternal being was born. Do you see what I mean? So he, like he had, he, he confined himself into time, first of all, <laughs> you know? Like this is a very weird idea because God is outside of time. God sees all of time from the beginning to the end and he doesn't need to, you know, he's not, but Jesus being God came into time. So confining himself by putting himself into time. This is a huge constriction on God. You know what I mean? Like God is outside of time. So to willingly accept that and be inside of time, that's a big deal. And then he's the all-powerful creator. So to put himself into such a weak position of a baby. Now we all know babies, you know, there are some animals that they're born and they just start going out into the world. You know, like these little turtle eggs that they bury in the sand and then the turtles get up and they crawl over to the, they crack the egg and they crawl over to the ocean and they just start swimming. Nobody's there to take care of them and a bunch of them get eaten by seagulls or whatever along the way. But, but you know, they, they're not, they survive on their own, whichever ones survive. But human babies are not like that. You have a human baby and you put it outside in this wilderness, you know, the wilderness of the front yard and the, the, the baby will die. You know what I mean? Like the baby needs the baby is completely dependent. And so here's the eternal creator of the universe, the all-powerful one, putting himself into this very tiny, vulnerable position that is in, just needs all the time. You know, babies can't give you anything. You think your baby loves you, but you don't really know that because all the baby cares about is that you give the baby what the baby wants and when it receives it it's happy so maybe it can receive from you but maybe it can receive from somebody else and be just as happy you don't know if the baby loves you I'm sorry you know maybe I'm making people mad but <laughs> but but you know no the, the, your baby loves you from the moment it's born I promise but <laughs> but but you know, you, the, the baby is completely dependent and just needs. It needs to be cleaned. It needs to be given food and nurtured. And if we don't give that attention to it, it will die. And the creator of the universe put himself in this extremely vulnerable position in the hands of humans. And he did it 2,000 years ago when there was not the clean, clean sterile standards of the world today. You know what I mean? It, it, there was this chance. I mean, how many babies died back then? What percentage? A lot, you know? And so, um, you know, I even heard this before that in some of the ancient times, you know, in certain places, they wouldn't even give their kids names until they were 10 years old just to make sure they would survive, <laughs> you know? Well, let's see which one lives and then we'll give him a name, you know, kind of a thing. Th th this is like the way it was. And so part of the reason our population on Earth is growing so rapidly in the last 100 years is because we figured out how to keep babies alive. You know, very interesting. So, so here's the creator of the universe 
in this extremely vulnerable position. He became flesh. And he lived among people. That means he bled. He, he, he learned a human language, you know, and he went through all the different things and he, he got made fun of for different stuff and he put all of his power uh, aside. He could have, you know, some bully makes fun of him at school and he could have, you know, sort of zap, zap and change his, his ears into really big, you know, elephant kind of things or whatever, you know, I mean, he could have done all kinds of stuff, but he didn't do any of that. We don't read about any of that stuff happening, no miracles, anything until he's ready to do his ministry. And so <clears throat> this is very, very interesting. Um, and then, you know, he did the unthinkable and allowed himself to be handed over to die. So not only was he born in such a vulner vulnerable manner, but he then allowed his, his life to be taken and he allowed himself to be completely in the hands of the Roman soldiers and, and the, the Jewish leaders who put him in the hands of the Roman soldiers to painfully um, afflict him and and kill him on a cross. You're like a criminal, you know? Not like a smooth criminal, like a really bad criminal. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about here? And, and so, you know, um, so, so he died. And there were many Jewish people around that time, many different little leader guys who came up and had bands of guys following them, you know, these groups that followed them. And they said, you know, follow me and we will get free of the Romans and we're going to be, we're going to, um, you know, and I'll be the Messiah, basically, kind of thing. And so there were all these people, these different leaders who they thought, the, the, the Jewish people thought, maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the Messiah. And what happened was they all died. And so Jesus died. And everyone thought he's just like the rest of them. He's just another one of these guys who did a bunch of interesting things and rebelled against Rome a little bit. And then, you know, and then they killed him. And it's over. Next. But that is not what happened. Jesus rose again. Now this changes everything. You know, if this fact is true, if Jesus rose again from the dead, then this is the most important historical fact in all of history. Right? right? And this, so, so, how do we know that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, we depend entirely on what? On the testimony of other people who saw that. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead because of the lives that were changed by the people who saw him. And so, you know, if you, if you look in the book of Acts, let me just see exactly this quote here. You know, you, you read about what, um, what happened in Acts 4.33, if you read about what, what happened before Jesus rose from the dead and how everyone was running scared and some denying Jesus and all of a sudden, but what, what made them so bold? What all of a sudden gave them courage? In Acts 4.33, it says that the, the disciples, the apostles, gave witness with great power of the resurrection of, of the Lord Jesus and with great grace and, and, and this great grace was with everyone. And so what gave them this power? The fact that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. And so, you know, thinking about this, um, that we stand on the shoulders of all the believers who have gone before us, 2,000 years of people passing this message on. And so, Peter, you know, he was crucified upside down in Rome. So he said, they said, we're going to crucify you. And he said, I don't want to be crucified like my Lord. I don't really, I'm not worthy of this. 
So they turned his cross upside down, and you know, that's even a crazy thing to imagine, but because crucifixion is already horrible, but turn somebody upside down, you know, it's even worse. And, you know, according to the, the, uh, the history and uh, tr traditions of the church that we have, all the disciples, all those 11 disciples that were with Jesus in the beginning, they all died deaths by, by, uh, by either um, crucifixion or, <clears throat> you know, we have, we have in, in uh, Acts how Jacob, uh, or sorry, uh, James was, was killed by the sword, you know, and, and all these different people lost their lives. Why? Because they believed in Jesus. They, why? Nobody would die for something that they knew was a lie. Right? And so you have people, and the, the only one who survived is the guy John who wrote this book, the Gospel of John. And they tried to kill him by throwing him a big vat of boiling oil and he somehow lived. And so then they put him on the island of Patmos in this prison way out in the middle of the Mediterranean. And that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. Right? So we have all these people who were the eyewitnesses and it completely changed their lives. Why? Because they were not afraid because they said, look, Jesus rose from the dead. We don't have to be worried about the life, our life on this earth so much because we have proof that we have eternal life because what Jesus said was true. He's the resurrection and the life. So even if we die, we will live. So we can be bold. We don't have to be so worried about anything because we know Jesus rose from the dead. And so... Um, So we depend on the testimony of other people. Now let's look for just for a second back in John chapter 1. And it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And John testified about him and cried out, saying, this was a, he of whom I said, he, come, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And this is talking about John the Baptist, right? So John the Baptist came, and he, was, he came before Jesus and said, this person coming after me, he's actually before me. He's, he existed before me, and he's better than me. He's, he is much better than me, and, um, you know, he's higher rank than I. He's, he's somebody more important, and you should pay attention. So, so John had a lot of disciples who were, a lot of people who followed John came out and were baptized by him, but, but he said, Jesus is more important than I am. You should pay attention to Jesus because he's more important than me. And then when Jesus came, a lot of John's disciples went over to Jesus, right? And so then he went to prison, he was beheaded, and, and his ministry was over. But Jesus, his ministry kept going, and all these, you know, all these people were following him now. So, what's the point of all this? So, Jesus changed himself in a certain way in order to save us. That's the point of what I'm trying to say here. That the incarnation is an amazing event that happened because Jesus was willing to come and be among people, confine himself to time, confine himself to this, this kind of dependency. And then when he left, he gave no other instructions besides the fact that his disciples should tell the story. They should be witnesses. They should testify to what God has done and be faithful about telling the truth about Jesus. That's, that's all he said. He didn't say, you know, take some video in HD and then show everybody that I'm alive. He just said, no, you know, tell everyone what has happened and how it's changed your life. So, we have one other example, and I'm just going to read this one passage in 1 Corinthians 9. <clears throat> 9 verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, 
so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To win the weak, I became weak to win the weak. Pay attention right here. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. So, um, Paul says, I've become all things to all people, like the Jews, like people under the law, like people not under the law, in order that some might be saved. Now, my question for you this morning is, we have this example of Jesus, right? We have this example of Jesus who came and changed himself in very meaningful ways in order to reach people. Then we have Paul, who changed himself in very meaningful ways to reach people. You know, like he, he came and said, you know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to go and reach those people in that place. I'm not just going to, you know, you know uh, stay the way I am when all these people are there and I need to, you know, act differently around them in order to help them reach to, to you know, maybe I need to wear a different shirt so they'll, reach, they'll have the gospel. And so that's what he did. But these two people also, at the same time, they weren't faking it somehow. They, didn't, they maintained authenticity, and they were not compromising. So, you know, um, my question for us is how far would we go out of our way for the sake of the gospel? You know, what kind of changes could we and should we and would we make if we knew that this would bring the gospel to people. Because Jesus made incredible changes. He confined himself in ways that were, are unimaginable to us so that we could be saved. So what, what ways can we think about ourselves and say, well, you know, maybe I need to change the way I am a little bit to help somebody else come to the gospel. Maybe I need to change the time I take my lunch break so that I can go and be with these people at that time Maybe I need to, you know, maybe I need to act a slightly different way around these people. Is there some way that I can be more effective for the gospel by allowing God to change me in a, you know, and try to reach them across a cultural barrier, across a language barrier? Is there a language I need to learn? Is there, is there something I need to do that God could say to me, you know, do this so you can reach the people around you? And so, you know, every one of us is in a different context. I mean, if you look at me and Irene's life, we've learned a completely different language. Our culture has changed. You know, we're not exactly American anymore in, in some ways. You know, our, we, our, the way we like, I eat salad for breakfast. You know what I mean? That's like totally Middle Eastern. And, and so, you know, we, we have like kind of different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things because we were trying to reach people in Israel. And so, you know, for example, we like to eat, Pork, you know, we don't have any problem with eating bacon. We like bacon. <laughs> but in Israel, we're not going to, we could. There's, there's actually, it's kind of crazy. There are, there are um, places where they, grow, you know, uh, raise pigs, right? But because in the Bible it says you're not supposed to raise pigs on the land of Israel, what they do is they put them all on these platforms so that they're not touching the <laughs> land. <laughs> And that way, they can raise them. And it's fine. It's, I'm telling you the truth. I, it's crazy. But, but I, I, we just don't, we don't have that in our house. Because some people ask. And they say, you know, well, you, you're, you're not a Jewish, so do you eat pork? Do you have pork in your fridge? And we go, no, we don't have any in there. We just, uh, it's not a big deal to us, you know. I'll be happy to not eat pork if that's going to help you come to, the, come to the gospel. Not because I don't have the freedom to, because I have the freedom to do whatever I want. I'm an American. <laughs> you know what I mean. We have that attitude here sometimes. And sometimes we need to say, I'm going to set aside my freedom so that I can reach somebody else, because I could do whatever I want. But I'm not going to, for the sake of the gospel. So, you know, how 
will this change our lives if we consider these things, you know? Um, you know, how far would you be willing to go for the sake of the gospel? And maybe that's not an actual physical distance, you know? Maybe that's actually a, a distance in yourself. What would you be willing to change for the sake of the gospel? Maybe you need to change some things for the sake of the gospel so that you can reach some of the people around you. Maybe you need to exercise less independence in a certain way, less of your freedom to reach other people. Maybe you need to relax and have a little more freedom to reach some other people. I don't know who you are and what your exact person, personality is, you know, but, but this sense of purpose is really what we need in our life, you know? The gospel is our purpose. And many times in this world, we have all of these things all the commercials in the world are trying to convince you that your, your life on earth is so important right now that you need to go and buy this new, you know, Pepsi Zero or whatever it is. Or, you know, you must have that right now because life on earth is so important. Well, life on earth is important for one reason, to tell people about the gospel. You know, like, it doesn't matter. If, if I don't have to have a Pepsi today so that I can share the gospel with you, then I'm going to do that. You know, and, and so, so what, what kind of, you know, we, we have to work. We need to work. We need to do our work. We need to earn money. We need to take care of our families. And hopefully we're sharing the gospel in our own families in whatever way we can. But we also, you know, need to be sharing the gospel outside of our families. And, and as we're doing the things of daily life, this is the sense of purpose that we need in our life. You know, um... The, the other things, they're just not fulfilling. I, I have a son who's very excited about gifts, you know. <laughs> and he gets really excited when it's his birthday, you know. And we give him, he's got some, you know, presents. And he's like so excited. What can I open the presents? What can I open them? What can I open them? And then he comes and he, he like rips them all open. And that's like this big letdown for him. Because, because he's so excited about opening them. And then he opens them all, and it's over. And it's not, you know, it's not enough. And so you can have as many worldly things in this world as you want. You can have all this stuff, and you can still not be fulfilled. And you can be chasing after that next thing, and that bigger whatever. But we need this sense of purpose in our life, the gospel. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to share the gospel with my family, with the people who are close to me, and the people who are far from me, whether that's be distance, culture, language, whatever it is, what can we do, and what is God calling us to do to change about ourselves so that we can share the gospel with other people? You know? And so, just think about that for a moment. Um, we're going to finish right now, and uh, we'll sing a song together, another song that we wrote. And, um, but first, before I do that, I just can't give this message without asking this question. Is there someone here today who would like to become a follower of Jesus? Who would like to say, you know what? I don't know who this, you know, I, I, I haven't ever followed Jesus with my life. Maybe I've heard about him before, but I would like today to become a follower of Jesus. I would like to make Jesus my king. I would like to become a citizen of that kingdom Above every other citizenship that I have, I would like to follow Jesus. And so is there somebody here this morning who is saying, I, I, I need to change my life this morning by just becoming a follower of Jesus, you know? So if, is, is there anybody here this morning who would like to do that? I'd like to raise your hand right now. Amen. Is there anybody else who would like to say, I'd li today I'd like to become a follower of Jesus? Be brave. Because God's talking to you right now if it's you. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to pray with you. Okay? So everybody, let's pray, and we're going to pray together. And I'm going to have to say a prayer, and everyone just say it with me. So let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven. Our Father. Let's just say it right after me. Just repeat after me. Our Father in heaven. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the life and the light that you give us in Jesus. We 
know that we are sinners. And that we need you this morning. And so we give you our lives from now until the end of our lives. And we ask that you would change us and help us to follow you. Thank you that you've forgiven us of all of our sins. And we give you our lives in exchange for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the family. So, um, now uh, I'd like to ask one more question. Is there anybody here who feels that God is speaking to them? That there is something about their life that they would like to change in order to help share the gospel better? Is there anybody who, who's got to speak to you right now and saying to you, you know what, there are things in my life that I need to do so that I can be more effective in sharing the gospel? Things I need to learn, things I need to change, things I need to, things I need to be not afraid to try. You know? Is there anybody like that? Who, who, would, you, would you raise your hand with me today? Amen. All right, so what we're going to do is pray together. So I'm going to pray for you guys. Let's stand up and let's pray, and we're going to sing together. <clears throat> Father, I pray as this morning that you would help us as we want, to, we, we want to be more effective in sharing the gospel. We want to be more effective in giving your good news. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to um, submit ourselves and our choices in our lives to you. And we pray that you would change us and help us to be um, tools in your hands that, that can be useful in sharing the gospel. And we thank you for your love for us that is never failing, never ending. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So why don't we stand and sing together? All right, so this is a, a new song we wrote, and um, and um, you know that there there are three hundred and sixty thousand people born every day. Do you know that? Every day, there are 360,000 people born, and 150,000 people die every day. And so we need to be much more effective in what we're doing. There's 360,000 more people today than there was yesterday who need to hear the gospel. And what are we doing to do that? You know, what, are, what, is, what is our part? So much suffering all around us Like an ever-growing wave People born so thirsty for you People dying still empty You send us out to brave the darkness Put your light into our hearts You never leave us, oh Lord Jesus You won't forsake us in the dark You are the light of the world The only way to the Father You satisfy our thirst with your living water you are the light of the world the only way to the father you are the truth and the light and there is no other
You placed us here for your good purpose. And by your spirit, you give us strength. Strength to stand and be your witness. To bring good news to the lost and dying. That's how to brave the darkness. You put your light into our hearts. You never leave us, oh Lord Jesus. You won't forsake us in the dark. You are the light of the world, the only way to the Father. You satisfy our thirst with your living water. Oh, you are the light of the world, the only way to the Father. You are the truth and the light. And there is no other, so let this hope we know overflow, overflow from our hearts and lips to this broken world. Let this hope we know overflow, overflow from our hearts and lips to this broken world. much left to do in so very little time like the do we disappear in so very little time gotta spread the good news in so very little time let your light shine through let your light shine through me so much left to do in so very little time like the do we disappear in so very little time gotta spread the good news in so very little time let your light shine through let your light shine through so much left to do in so very little time like the do we disappear very little time, gotta spread the good news. So very little time, let your light shine through. Let your light shine through me. You are the light of the world, the only way to the Father. You satisfy our thirst with your living water. You are the light of the world, the only way to the Father. You are the truth and the light, and there is no other. Amen. So, Lord, this morning we give you our lives, we give you our church. We pray that you would use us to shine your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll have to talk to you in the back afterward. God bless.